Um, it's true that discussing this in Barcelona inevitably takes us 25 year, 21 years uh, behind um, and, and the dreams of the Barcelona process seem to be a far away golden uh, era um, and, and we could easily uh, indulge in just doom and gloom uh, but this document, the yearbook, is in the think tank community at least, is a reference piece of work. Anybody in the US, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, working on Mediterranean issues has this as a reference document. And as you mentioned at the beginning, not a bad job when you look at the key subjects on the first page of the table of contents that were elaborated exactly a year ago. Well, it is what is happening. Um, not a very joyful situation, but this is what is happening. And when we do uh, this kind of exercise, which of course uh, lasts for uh, a full year, uh, we have to try to give some intelligent reading, if we can, of a very complex world. And the world today is much more complex than 21 years ago, Barcelona process or uh, after the fall of the uh, Soviet Empire, or indeed much more complex than during the Cold War. What, what we have in, 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 front of them, in front of us is a series of turbulences, to, to take Attila's word. We have a populist wave across Europe. Look at France, look at the Netherlands, look at Central Europe, Austria, UK. And, and populism is the politics of the lowest instinct. You don't think much, you don't explain anything, you lie a lot, uh, as we've seen in the Brexit referendum, or as we see now with one of the candidates in the US. Um, but you try to encapsulate the frustrations of the people. We have authoritarianism in, in the wider European region. We, of course, have terrorism. We have refugees and migrants. We have political Islam, as was, uh, was explained. And to close the circle, we have a crisis of confidence in, in the EU from the European public uh, itself. And these elements sort of coalesce to create a new political culture, uh, to, to create a, a sort of new setup, not just in Europe, but in the Mediterranean. And if there is one thing that uh, we can safely say compared to the time of the Barcelona Conference in November 95, is that the EU project or the set of EU values doesn't sell anymore very well in the Mediterranean. Uh, I, I vividly remember in uh, the early part of 2011, some of my colleagues in Brussels and elsewhere were saying, look, look, this, this Arab Spring is wonderful. They're all saying what we said in Barcelona. Uh, you know, rule of flow, uh, freedom of expression, independent judiciary, accountability, this and that and the rest. It's true, uh, but they were not saying this by reference to the EU. They were saying this because these were their own uh, uh, requirements or, or demands. Now, if we look ahead, and especially if we look at, from, at it from a, a perspective of the think tank community, and there are many, many people from think tanks uh, writing for the yearbook, um, what should we do? Should we give up in front of populism, authoritarianism, migration crisis and so on? Should we lament on the return of populism like in the 1930s uh, in, in Europe? Um, should we uh, lament on the lack of leadership in the EU institutions and so on and so forth? I think uh, what we have to do is try to foresee what the key issues will be in, in one year, which is always a very risky exercise given the volatility of things, and, and try to, at least from my perspective after 35 years of EU public service, try to abandon our Eurocentric perspective. Because if we look at 
in the current situation, take the Syrian war, the refugees <laughs> from Syria, or more widely, the migrants from Africa. Uh, Europe has a very, very great difficulty in coping with all of this, uh, but at the same time is suffering from all of this. One, because it doesn't have many uh, foreign policy instruments to deal with that. It has a number of instruments, but in a very non-coordinated manner. And secondly, the Syrian war is a totally new form of war. It's a proxy war, as we all know, but it's a war where the traditional guarantor of security in the Middle East, the US, has turned into a reluctant warrior, where a traditionally non-major player, Russia, is a major player and has uh, the Assad regime in its hand, uh, together with Iran and, and Hezbollah, by definition. Um, and therefore, if you have a new player, Russia, uh, an old player that is gone absent the US and an European would-be player that doesn't play any role because member states essentially uh, do not want to, you're faced with a new set of issues, uh, a new setup where in the end events that are happening outside the EU borders, Syria, migration, the economic situation in West Africa or the aftermath of the coup in Turkey do influence events and situations in the European Union. So the paradox of this time, and this is probably going to last until the next uh, yearbook is, is out, is that the EU has major strategic interest in the region, uh, doesn't do much, although in the end it absorbs, in terms at least of terrorism and refugees, a good chunk of the consequences. Um, the whole thing being complicated, of course, by the Brexit debate, uh, because if we think in terms of security, essentially European external interventions were relying on France and the UK, the two largest armies and the two armies with a large uh, projection, force projection capacity. Uh, one is out, one is inside. They will still work together, but still. Um, so we feel that sometimes the challenges are bigger than they've ever been in recent history, but the equipment, the toolbox that we have as Europeans uh, is somewhat limited. And of course, uh, at, at the very same time, the um, actions of other actors such as Russia are deliberately anti-European. Uh, I'm not saying Russia is in Syria to be anti-European, but if you look at the relationship between Russia and political parties in Greece, in France, in Hungary, uh, in the UK, all of that is you know, working against the uh, EU system. So what we have to, to do, it seems to me, uh, this was part of our discussion earlier uh, for the next year's edition, uh, is to try to identify those areas and those actors uh, which are important for both the north and the south of the Mediterranean and which have to work, if not together, but alongside, in ways that are completely different from what we had in front of us before. And this is, I think, a, a key challenge of our time. In doing so, of course, uh, it would be very easy, uh, and in a way Europe has done it in part, uh, to forget about fundamental values, what makes Europe still stand as an example, which is rule of law, of course. Uh, we could forget about that. And You've seen our European governments in the past five and a half years of war in Syria go from a very solid, strict, intransigent attitude on Assad must go in 2011 to something that has completely changed 180 degrees and without saying it too loud, we can work with Assad. Along the way, Turkey has followed the same evolution and the US, of course. Um, 
But we should not forget that in the region, even though people in Tahrir or people on Avdi Bourguiba uh, or Syrians were not necessarily inspired by EU values, but you still have a very solid chunk of the population in these countries that adhere to those fundamental principles that are founding the European Union, meaning individual liberties, uh, rule of law, etc., etc. And although it doesn't export well as, as a brand and certainly cannot be exported as we thought it could in 1995, these are still the core expectations of a very large number of people in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, by the way, in Turkey as well. Um, and, and this should remain in different ways with different methods, the, the core message of, of the Europeans in, in working uh, with, uh, with the, the region, even though that brand of governance doesn't sell uh, very well. I think I'll stop here. Thank you.